so everybody, I think, more or less knows that at the time uh, Monet was painting, somebody, some critic or observer, used the word impressionism to describe what he was doing. And I assume it was because somewhere or other, Monet and others were talking about trying to paint the impression of what they saw instead of objects and to use a strategy that had to do with the visual phenomena in isolation, right? So it was a visual impression on your eye. Well, if you've been hanging around me much, and if you are, if you've read The Twilight of Painting, you know that Gamel gives the word impressionism. He lowers the eye and drops it from an uppercase eye, which applied to the Monet French Impressionists, and, uh, and he gives it a lowercase eye and then describes it in The Twilight of Painting, which you should look up, those couple chapters there, uh, where he describes Impressionism in academic painting. And, uh, but what he essentially does is calls anything painted directly from observations right in front of you Impressionism. Now, I should have looked at that closer to make sure I'm not wrong. Sometimes you say things... Uh, <laughs> you know, based, based on uh, uh, certain previous understandings, and then you elaborate just one point too far. Uh, anybody who's spoken as a teacher knows how easy it is to do that. But I think you'll find that to be the case. I've never thought otherwise. So there's a significant difference between Impressionism, for example, if you mean that when, when uh, shall we say, Leighton, painted the portrait of Sir Richard Burton, which I'm not going to show, uh, that he was doing Impressionism. He, he was drawing an outline of an individual who was sitting in a chair probably the whole time. Uh, you know, he probably did all that stuff, did drawings, did preliminary stuff, did his eyes, whatever else, and then he painted the, you know. Well, for the most part, what we're calling Impressionism today really has considerably more to do with painting directly from life and using the, the naive eye of purely visual phenomena, as Monet describes it, and um, the innocent eye. So, <laughs> well, I, what's that leading up to? David asks, he's, I mean, he says, yeah, could you say more about the differences between R. H. Ives' gamel and Henry Henchy approaches to Impressionism. And I've spoken to you earlier on about uh, things that I see in certain Gamel students uh, that, that suggest that the approach to Impressionism is different from Monet. And it's different from the Boston School, too. But I'm going to manage to probably stay mostly away from the Boston School <laughs> thinking today, even though it, that's largely what I'm doing this for, and I'll, so I'll bring enough background in. But let's just look at who Henshi is and, uh, and who Gamel is as painters. They did, they did exist, exist at roughly the same time. Uh, so here's, here's Henry Henshi's work, because I understand that these are both his. Uh, but this is fairly typical of what you'd see. As I understand it, virtually all the work out of that background is, is um, palette knife work. So you can understand a certain limit to the uh, articulation of drawing if there was any intention to make any drawing. You can also see plainly here the um, orientation around color and light. And uh, Henshi says uh, that Hawthorne, from whom he learned everything, was merely trying to teach what Monet was doing. And that's what it looks like. It really does strongly look like that color notes related to each other and, and plowed around through the picture with an afterthought being drawing. Uh, the, uh, the landscapes, but these are, so these are, these are uh, uh, still lives. And again, uh, you can correct me or not, but Henshi did demonstrations like the one in the upper left and, um, and uh, finished, to whatever extent he finished pictures, he finished them rather like when well, they were really finished. I mean, I, the one in the bottom... Uh, with the X in the middle of it, that's interesting, is, uh, is a, um, 
uh, you know, a more finished work, even though you wouldn't describe it as anything in the sense of, you know, what an academic would probably want to do. Uh, it's, but still, it's, it, you know, it's closer to the Boston School of Thinking. Uh, you can see, again, in all these cases, there's an, these, I think this is an artificial light one, so you can see this orientation around uh, getting the light, getting the sense of the light, and, and using uh, a chroma as well as values um, and color. So, but that's the Henshi thing. As I said, I think even these, I think, are probably palette knives, but the bottom, the, the bottom one looks like it could be, it could be a brush in there although I really haven't looked at it that close. And so here's the Monet background, right? Now that's what it is. I mean, I, this, it, it appears that Monet is primarily working with brushes and plenty of paint, uh, which is certainly what's characteristic of um, people who want to get that color quality that Monet is doing with these intensities and uh, broken color combinations and all those sorts of things. But you can see, I'll go back again, you can you can see the similarities just between the landscapes, right? Between those of Monet. And uh, no, I, I want to say this, that by the way, I'm not, go, I'm not gonna tell you I know stuff about these guys. I'm just telling you what I'm observing right here in front of you, okay? I know about Gamel, uh, but I really want to just suggest to you, David and others, that you really do your own observing. Use, look, use your own eyes and notice the differences between people's work. Um, so here's here's um, Gamble in the upper left, and um, and some some people would argue that's a terrific impressionist painting. It's not a Monet impressionist painting. I mean, it's the the, the relative limits of the color are striking. Um, the Paxton to the right uh, is considerably more colored, has more more of a range of color, uh, and the bunker below, of course, is probably Gamble's model in a certain sense. That is to say, he wanted as much drawing as he could possibly get, uh, and, and he would much rather sacrifice color uh, than drawing. And that is characteristic. That's probably the primary difference between these two guys. I can't tell you in that, uh, in that painting of Gamels in the corner there how much drawing he did beforehand. I'd be hard-pressed to think he wasn't really working on that tree, <laughs> uh, maybe at the expense of a lot of other things, but I didn't see it in, in, in evolution and in, in development. Um, but um, in all three cases here, you can see a considerable attention to outlines and to drawing. And uh, Bunker, of course, the bottom guy, was the teacher of, of Paxton. And of course, Bunker was a hero to Gamel. And, um, and then, of course, Paxton was a 15-year teacher of, of, uh, of Gamel. Gamel, uh, at one point, said to, uh, to um, uh, Paxton that he really didn't, he really, I don't know if he said he hated landscape, but that Paxton said to him, then you need to get out and be doing it, uh, which is one of those interesting, very interesting points. You know, I, even though, and by the way, when you, when you say that, oops, going too far here, when you say that, that's rather a significant thing, because I get the feeling that Gamble, though he hung around the Boston School guys like crazy, do them inside out, he was rather like that in general, that he already made up his mind about he wanted to, what he wanted to do with painting, and really didn't look and really didn't evolve as a Boston School painter, even though he implied that he would like to have uh, to have had Tarbell say uh, understanding and abilities. Um, so, so that's one of those interesting things. And I'm recommending to young people that you don't make up your mind so quickly. You may have have in the back of your mind what you want to do, but make sure your first job is to be good at everything and to understand well uh, why you know in the course of what it's going to take to paint a landscape and get all the qualities of both drawing and color and light. I throw color and light in there as one word. So, um, so, so here's another gamble, and you can see his dedication to drawing, um, but he's got a better feeling for light in both of these, but it's more like the Hudson River School in the upper one. And, um, and the bottom one, of course, you're down in a river, and I don't know if there are any sparkles of sunlight or not down in that spot. So it doesn't give us much of a chance to see what he potentially could do, but I've never seen one particularly any better than this one from the point of view of trying to reach out for what we think of as Impressionist color. But there's no evidence, whatever, that he was approaching it from a Monet point of view with, with, with striving to really let the color carry the day. Uh, it's probably all I should say and go away, shouldn't I? Uh, but 
so here's on the left a, a drawing by Hawthorne. Hawthorne was teaching at the time that Gamble would have been around, hanging around Providence Prov I think. And uh, and uh, so this one on the right is uh, another one of those. There's a kids fishing there. This this whole this whole uh, world was full of I guess Portuguese kids that were all from f fishing families and that sort of thing. And they the kids would be willing to sit for some money. Um, and uh, so this is a gamel, and this one over here is it. By the way, do you like my big arrow, guys? <laughs> I forget who asked me to do that, but I was having trouble seeing my own arrow, so I decided to blow it up. Uh, in any case, <laughs> this is a Hawthorne. This is a Gamble. Basically, they, it's almost like Gamble could have been studying with Hawthorne. I've, I've, there's no evidence that I know of whatsoever. And by the way, I don't think I've ever heard Gamble particularly say anything negative or positive about Hawthorne. But that's the background that Henchy comes from. He comes from this guy on the left. And uh, this is actually what he's doing in this painting, and there's evidence of him doing plenty of others. So his training would have been similar to whatever Gam training Gamel had at that point. But Gamel, um, and so 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 Gamel had the Paxton, whatever, uh, you know, the connection. But here again, I'm going to show you Paxton is a guy who's painting outdoor light, trying to get the color notes and all those sorts of things, but he's heavy-handed rather with the drawing. He just it's different. The Monet thing is different. And even here in this Hawthorne thing, you can see that it's different. This is, a, this is reputed to be a Hawthorne. I can't verify that any of this is true. I'm finding this online, and I think it is. But, but uh, I'd never seen one like this before by him. So I, it could be four other guys. Uh, and, and then like, when you see this, I, what I believe is now a Henshi, uh, um, uh, probably a um, demo, and if not his, it would be characteristic of the way they would carry out a painting. You can see the secondary attention to drawing uh, compared with, with a, uh, of course, that's an earlier phase. This, this isn't a demo. This is, this is a finished painting. So nevertheless, um, I've never seen a uh, Henshi that has any level of drawing apart from that still life I just showed you a few minutes ago. Uh, most of them are way, way, way oriented around getting the color of light. Uh, you know, getting effects, getting light effects to glow. And uh, frankly, to the point of exaggerating them uh, in ways that I find uh, unpleasing and uh, yeah, false. So um, why am I showing you this one? This is the Boston School, of course. Um, the difference in some ways, uh, oh, I know I'm showing you this, uh, because the Paxton thing is, uh, the, this isn't, well, this guy's got perfectly good drawing in it. You, got, you can't see that he's into drawing. He does the drawing, but he's into the package. And, and Paxton, as I showed you, always feels like he's into drawing the girl, et cetera, et cetera, right? Drawing the jacket. And his approach overall, apart from using Monet color, is considerably more like what you would expect in a uh, student of, of Ang, perhaps. So, um, and again, the same thing here. There's no a attention to, to noodling up a dress in any of these uh, young people. Uh, or noodling up a tree in any of these areas. Again, he's, he's painting the visual impression, and he's using authentic, uh, mar for example, he's, he's really drawing when he's drawing this. He's really drawing what he sees. He's not making up junk to sort of suggest. Uh, that would be a little bit more typical of, the, um, of the, uh, what you see in those earlier uh, henchies, where it rather looks like he's just uh, sort of poking at the drawing a little bit and suggesting this and suggesting that. Uh, so, should, shouldn't have made you do that. Okay. Okay, so, and then what happens uh, with lax students? And this is one of those things where I actually frankly believe that this is the conglomeration of the two, the sort of, I think both Hunter, this guy, and Lack must have hung out with uh, Henshi in Provincetown. And uh, I can be corrected, but there's, the evidence is in, in the drawing suggested to me very strongly, uh, especially the, the hyper uh, color in, in the lac, which just is like beyond the pale, uh, is way more like what you see in, uh, in a Henshi. And yet the drawing is way more like what you would expect in a Paxton or a, um, or a Gamel. So that's largely what the difference is. Um, and you should you can you should be able to see that for yourself. Uh, so let's just I think this is my last couple things. Let's just end with uh, 
uh, Robert Douglas Hunter, what he does is considerably more suggestive. Uh, uh, the drawing, he's, he's, he's somewhere, again, he's somewhere in between. He lands closer to the Boston School than Lack does. Lack lands closer to, um, Lack lands closer to the uh, Paxton model with this with this overt and what I would su suggest to you by comparison with the the, the uh, Boston School uh, uh, over the top drawing. Um, so yeah, but but you can see he's doing the same thing with where there's something to be drawn. He's articulate, you know, at at key points, but he's not in there making every little thing. Uh, he's articulating effects at key places, right? drawing where drawing is needed and doing other things rather in the direction of suggestion and um, broader statements, grand, grand movements of color and value into color, color into color. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's the best probably I can do with that. I don't mean, I, I apologize for seeming tired. I maybe am tired in the presentation today, but do observe these things with your own eyes. I don't have anything to add to this. Uh, my my landscape work with Gamo was, uh, you know, in a couple summers with him was, um, um, I would say it had nothing in it like the Boston School training. But it, it also had nothing in it like the Henshi uh, thing. It was something else. And I wouldn't have been able to say anything except that when we worked with Gamo, it was all about the drawing. And we knew it when we were out landscape painting. There are a couple painters alive today that, and I don't want to talk about any other painters in particular, but who, who have also taken Gamble's stuff, you know, the, what he was offering in the classroom, and gone outdoors with it, and has paid considerably more attention to, to, um, to patterning, which is a really interesting phenomena. Uh, uh, it, that combination, uh, sort of a flattening out of the picture. And then uh, paying more attention to the, to the to, to, to flat shapes in their play, um, but sometime I'll talk to the person who does that. See if see if he'd like to elaborate on what his what his thinking is or what his background was with Gamble that gave him that inclination. Okay, well, so David, there it is. Uh, didn't mean to bore you all. Uh, see you next time, and please do continue with your comments and share, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, subscribe, of course, and uh, thank you.